So exam two is coming up next week. It was going to be during the lab period on Tuesday. I think, watch the website because I might change this, but I think what I'm going to do is give you the same exam I would have given you and just leave it to you to proctor yourself. So you'll need to set aside three hours and you could set aside the lab time if you want. You'll need to set aside three hours, uh, sit down, do the test. Um, you'll have an equation sheet and uh, that's all you're allowed to use is the equation sheet and your calculator. You will not be allowed to refer to any references and stuff and I'll just leave it to you to proctor yourselves and do that. So for today, I wanna review uh, what's going to be on this exam. So uh, it's all about circuits and magnetic fields and all of that starts with electric current which we defined a while back. Current is the flow of charge. It comes in units of amps. An amp is a coulomb per second, which means pick one point along this wire. Um, how many coulombs go past that point in one second? So you could think of it as just if you have a whole bunch of little charges marching along, um, the total number of charges times the charge of each one is going to be the total amount of charge that goes past that given point. Now, that's not really how it works. Um, the microscopic view, and we've talked about this, um, inside a conductor, like a metal, if you have a wire, which is made out of metal, um, these little red spots here represent the ions, the nuclei, the atoms of the metal lattice, and then the black lines, the little blue dots in the black lines represent the free electrons. So there are some electrons in metal that are not bound to individual atoms, but can move throughout the whole metal. But when do, what ends up happening is that they're always bouncing around all over the place and they bounce, you know, they get attracted to and bounce off of the nuclei and the electron clouds. And so it's a big chaotic mess all over the place. If you would apply an external electric field, that's what these green lines here are. So it's going off to the left. Um, the external electric field is going to exert a force to the right on the electrons. And so that's why all these lines bend a little bit because they're being accelerated to the right. Um, but then they, you know, will hit something and bounce and sort of get their, their path started over. And the result of all this acceleration uh, of all the force on this is that there will be a net drift velocity of electrons to the right, right? Because remember, electrons are negative. So their current is in the opposite direction from the electric field. So that little leftover velocity is the drift velocity and is much smaller than the actual physical velocity of the electrons. It's just the sort of extra net velocity that you have because this electric field is, is biasing the direction of the electrons a little bit. And so then we define the current in the wire in terms of these charge carriers uh, by this. So here's, here's a wire. There's got current I flowing along the wire. The wire has length L although that doesn't show up here. That'll show up a little bit later. But L hat is um, a unit vector along the direction of, of the wire, and it points in the direction that the current is flowing. This wire is a circle, cross-section circle, and so the cross-sectional area is pi r squared, and we'll call that A. So the current that's flowing through the wire is just the number density of charge carriers, that's number per volume, times the charge of one charge carrier, so NQ is now the charge density. Multiply that by the drift velocity that whatever it is that it has and the um, cross-sectional area that gives you the current. And then the drift velocity has a direction and so that L hat then is the same direction. Um, and so that's how you connect this little microscopic view of charges bouncing around with some leftover drift velocity to overall current. Um, so that's sort of understanding what's going on. When we actually work with it, most of the time we just work with current directly and don't worry about the fact that there's a drift velocity. But that's where it comes from. Um, there's also this concept of current density, and that is just, um, remember the current, if a current flows past a point, the current that's flowing past that point is spread over the cross-sectional area of the wire that um, the current is going through, right? So cut, cut a wire or imagine cutting a wire, that cross-sectional area, as current goes past that point, it's spread out over that area. So if you just divide the current by the area, that's what we call the current density. So current density is not like mass density. It's not mass per volume. It's current per cross-sectional area. Um, and so you see down here at the bottom, I L hat over A is the current density. That's right, I just took the current, I divided by that cross-sectional area. That gives me J, the current density. And then one thing you can do with current density um, is define this quantity conductivity, which is down on the bottom here. 
So this is just a summary of all the things. Current is the new thing that we're talking about. It's flow of charge. It comes in units of amps. Uh, we talked about drift velocity, number density, current density, and then here's the new thing. I mean, it's not new because this was in a lecture a few weeks ago. Um, conductivity, that's how you connect the electric field inside a conductor to the current density that flows. So that's what the sigma sub C is, is the conductivity. That is just a property of materials. You can look it up. Aluminum has one conductivity. Copper has another conductivity. Um, metals have a very high conductivity so that you can get an appreciable current density with a really, really small electric field. Small enough that we're going to approximate the electric field as zero inside wires because um, the, the potential difference from one side of a wire to another is going to be very small compared to, say, resistors and things like that. But there has to be a little bit to keep the current flowing. Um, you may have heard of superconductors, and those are things where the conductivity goes to infinity, and you don't actually need an electric field to keep a current going. But all the real wires we actually use, you do have to keep some, if you don't keep some electric field on it, um, the current will stop. But it's a really tiny electric field. So again, the conductivity is just a property of the material. It doesn't matter the size, shape, length of the wire. Conductivity is a property of the material. Um, that'll give you the current density. But then the current does depend on the shape of the wire. Well, okay, so current. That's what we do with current. What do we do with current? Well, we put them in electric circuits. So one thing to remember is that in a circuit, for current to flow, you have to have a complete circuit or a closed circuit, which means you must be able to trace a loop through the current, through the circuit that gets back where you started and, you, and it was continuous the whole way through. So if there's a broken spot, like if a wire ends, that's, not a, that's what we call an open circuit, right? A closed circuit is closed goes all the way around. Open circuit has a place where it, there's an end, and so it's open. Um, there's an opening in it. Um, current won't flow. Current will not flow along a wire to the end of the wire. It'll only flow around in a loop. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, and then we have these two Kirchhoff's rules, and here's the first of, of Kirchhoff's rules. The current into any junction of wires is zero. Charge won't build up. So right here, you've got this junction with I1 flowing in and I2 and I3 flowing out. At that T corner there, current, or no, sorry, charge won't build up. So the total amount of charge flowing in, the rate of it, has to equal the rate of charge flowing out. And then flowing out is just negative flowing in. So when I say the total current into any junction of wires is zero, what I mean is you take the current flowing in and then you subtract the current flowing out. That's the total current, the net current flowing into that junction. So in this case, you have I flowing in, I2 and I3 flowing out. You could say the total current in is the total current out. Now, I could have drawn all three arrows coming in. So draw I2 to the left and I3 up. And I would have said I1 plus I2 plus I3 equals zero. That would have meant if they're not all individually zero, one of them would have had to have been negative. What does that mean? It just means it's opposite the direction of the arrow that I drew. Um, it's like a vector along the length of the wire. Um, the component of the vector along the direction of the wire really is what that is. Um, so that's the first of Kirchhoff's laws. And the second one is the loop rule. And here's an example of using it. That just means you, um, uh, if you trace out a loop here, right? So it's, first of all, we have a junction, um, this junction right here. Um, you've got current I flowing in and I1 and I2 flowing out of that junction. So this first rule, I1, I minus I1 minus I2 equals zero. That's the total current in has to be zero. Notice I've subtracted the current out. Then the loop rule, what I do is I pick a point and I trace around the loop, right? And then as I trace around the loop, um, I uh, add up the voltage differences of all the things on the loop. So if I start right here, just below the battery, I go across the battery. So as I go across the battery, that means I add V0, right? So the short end is the negative side, the long end is the plus side, so that the long end is at a higher potential than the lower. So plus V0, I go around. Then if you go through something like a resistor, or this is a light bulb here, so here's light bulb number one. Um, if you're going with the current, through something like a resistor, there's a voltage drop. So the top is at a higher potential than the lower. So if V1 is the potential difference across this light bulb, I'll say minus V1, and that's down here. 
and then I continue around the loop to where I started. And since I've made it all the way around the loop here, now that total sum has to be zero. So you can work out, figure out equations that tell you how voltages and currents all relate to each other using Kirchhoff's rules. And then once you have a bunch of the equations, you can do algebra, and that can sometimes be a little nasty because you might have a whole bunch of equations. Um, but you know, in simple cases, it's not so bad. Like in this circuit, it wouldn't be so bad. Uh, you, you can do Kirchhoff's rules to figure stuff out. There's actually another loop here that I could do. And that is if I started at this point right here, and now I go up and notice I'm going opposite the direction of the current across number one. And so that means that um, the far side of the direction I'm going is at a higher potential than the low side. So I have plus V1 here, go across the top. And then as I go down here, um, I go from the top to the bottom, so along the direction of the current, so from higher potential to lower potential, so that's a minus V2, and then I'm back to where I started if I go around the loop. So from this loop, since the total voltage around the loop has to be zero, I have plus V1 minus V2 equals zero. So those are the three equations that I get here. So you can use that, and we did. There were homework assignments where you did that in earlier lectures where you did that. Now, in lab, we actually did have some lab where we used ammeters and voltmeters before um, we got kicked out to the winds. An ammeter measures current. Am, think amp. It's like an amp meter, right? It's an ammeter. Measures the current flowing through it. So that means you have to put the ammeter in line with the current, like what you see here. It measures the current flowing through it. The voltage drop across an ideal ammeter is zero. That means the potential difference between right here and here is zero. You want it to be like that because you don't want the ammeter to affect the circuit. So there's no junction here. So the current that goes in is the current that goes out. So there's no worry about that. But if you think about the loop rule, if I ran around this loop and there's a voltage drop across the ammeter, that would mean that now the voltage drop is going to be different across the light bulbs. So the, the voltage drop across an ideal ammeter is zero, and it just reads what the current is. And the other thing we did is the voltmeter. So the, but whereas an ammeter measures the current flowing through it, the voltmeter measures the voltage drop across an element. So from one side of the element to the other. So that means you hook up the voltage or the voltmeter so that one probe is on one side, the other probe is on the other side. It measures the potential difference between those two points. Now here, the current through an ideal voltmeter is zero. And again, that's so it doesn't affect the circuit. At this junction right here, if some current went through the voltmeter, then the current going through the light bulb would have been different than it would have been if the voltmeter hadn't been there. So the current through a voltmeter is zero. And so therefore, it doesn't affect the circuit. The potential difference between this point and this point um, is the same whether or not the voltmeter is there. All the voltmeter does is allow you to measure it. So those are two devices we use to measure it. Well, all right, so from there we went on and talked about Ohm's law and resistors. So first of all, resistance is a property that just says, I mean, its, it's name is very suggestive. It resists uh, current flowing through it. And to keep current flowing through it, what do you have to do? You have to put a potential difference across it. And if you remember, potential difference is connected to electric field. A bigger potential difference is a bigger electric field. You need more electric field to keep pushing the drift velocity through a resistor. So resistance, R, is the quantity we use in circuits. It's connected to the physical things by um, this new variable rho. That's the resistivity. Resistivity is just 1 over conductivity. So it's actually not even a new thing. Instead of rho times L over A, I could have written L divided by sigma A, and it would have meant exactly the same thing. L is the length of the, the element with resistivity rho, and A is the cross-sectional area in this picture. And that's how you actually make a a resistor and you could figure out the resistance of a wire and it turns out that it's not really big and that's why in circuits we pretend it's zero because it tends to be a lot smaller than any other resistors that we put in there All right so that's how you connect the the physical properties to it but then in a circuit we just draw this little jagged line as a resistor circuit element and we say however it's made we're not going to worry about how it's constructed it has resistance r and then Ohm's law V equals IR, or maybe better said is delta V equals IR. Delta V is the potential difference. So V equals IR, the V is the potential difference from the upstream side to the downstream side and stream meaning along the current of the resistor. And then I is the current flowing through the resistor and R is the resistance 
of the resistor. So then you can use that. If you have a resistor and you know the voltage across it, you can figure out the current that's going through it. You can also use this when you're doing Kirchhoff's laws with the loop rule. As you're going around and you say, what is the voltage across this resistor? And so instead of just saying VR, you can write it as IR. Um, so if this is like resistor one, you'd write I1, R1 or something like that. The current through this resistor times its resistance. And you can use that in the loop rule. And we did some examples of that as well. Did some homework with that as well. Well, all right. And of course, and, and another thing we did in lab is if you have more than one resistor together, how does the total resistance come together? What that means is the circuit on the left very simple circuit. I have a battery and I have um, on the right two resistors, R1 and R2. Well, the circuit on the right is equivalent to the circuit on the left. So now what I want to do is take the dashed boxed line on the left, take that out of the circuit so it's all by itself. What effective resistor would be the same as those two resistors together? Now, I don't have to have the battery hooked up to answer this question. Two resistors in series is two resistors in series. You hook up the battery to actually flow a current through it, right? So that's what I'm doing in this example. Um, so you can see if I had done the loop rule, um, I would have had V0 going up and follow the current, then minus I R1. There's only one current I, but that's resistor one, minus I R2. Um, Right, so it's a voltage drop across the resistor. So we're going down in voltage as we go along with the current. And we're back to where we started. And then if I add the IR1 and IR2 to both sides, I have this equation, V0 is IR1 plus IR2, or I factored out the I. On the right, it's just a single resistor. So it's just V equals IR. So you look at those two equations, you can see that the R tote is R1 plus R2. That's what it has to be for the loop rule to work. So if you have two resistors in series, the total resistance is just the sum of the resistors. If you think about them as like water pipes, that makes sense. You have a little thin water pipe. You make it twice as long. That's like having two in series. Um, it's going to resist the flow of water twice as much. You can also put resistors in parallel. So series, one after the other. Parallel means that their, their ends are next to each other. This is a more complicated equation to work out. You would actually have to play with, you have two loops um, and then a branch, and you would have to do all of that with um, the Kirchhoff's laws. If you do, and it's not that bad, you can do it. And I think I did it in class um, way back when. If you do it, you will work out on the left that the current I, the total current coming out of the battery, so this current's I1 and I2 through the two resistors, works out to be, once you've done the algebra, you've set up the loops and the junctions and you do the algebra, is V0 times this thing, um, R1 plus R2 over R1 times R2, and that's just, that's just if you start with the thing on the right, 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, put it over common denominator, you get the thing over here on the left. Well, and then I want to have over on the right here the, the current to be V over R, right? That's just V equals IR, divide both sides by R. The effective resistance of two resistors in parallel, well, that's what it is down here. R effective is just R1, R2 over R1 plus R2. Or you could say 1 over the effective is 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. If you look at this equation, notice R effective. I could have written that as R1 times R2 divided by R1 plus R2, right? R2 divided by R1 plus R2 is R2 divided by something bigger than R2. So R2 divided by R1 plus R2 is less than 1. So the effective resistance is R1 times something less than 1 means it's lower than R1. So when you put resistors in parallel, the effective resistance is less than the individual resistors. They do not add up. Um, and so again, if you think about water pipes, if I have a thin water pipe, and then I add a second thin water pipe next to it that the water can also flow through, now there's twice as much place for the water to flow, uh, water's going to flow more freely. All right, it's the same thing with this current and these resistors. So that's what happens when you have two resistors in parallel. Well, all right. And again, this is a review, so I'm just sort of quickly, I'm not trying to do everything. We've done this in class before. This is all review. You can also talk about power. Why do you care? Well, if it's a light bulb, you want to know how much light you're getting out of it. Or if it's a, a thing that does stuff and it has an effective resistance, how much power is it going to take to run it? Power is energy per time, right? So how much energy do I need? And if I want to keep it running for a certain amount of time, the power is the rate that I'm using up energy. And it turns out... Um, just remember from way back when, when we talked about electric potential, the change in potential energy of a charge Q as it moves through potential difference delta V. So it moves from one point in space to another point in space. 
and the difference in potential between those two points in space is delta v, then the change in potential energy is just q times delta v. Okay. Well, current is delta q divided by delta t. So if I take that pe equals q delta v, um, and I divide both sides by delta t, and then so current is delta q. So potential energy there, Q, that's the amount of charge that moved. Current I, delta Q, is the amount of charge that crosses in delta T. So that delta Q really is the same as the Q in the PE equation. Divide both sides by delta T. Um, on the left, we have energy divided by time, so that becomes power. On the right, we have charge divided by time. That becomes current times delta V. So P equals I delta V. For any circuit element, if there is a potential difference delta V across it, and a current I running through it, this P is the rate at which energy is either being stored in the circuit element or being dissipated by the circuit element. So for a capacitor, um, it doesn't actually dissipate energy. It stores energy as, it, as the charge builds up on the two plates. So if there's current running through the capacitor and momentarily it had this potential difference across it, that would be the rate momentarily that the capacitor was storing energy which means it has to take it out of a battery or something somewhere else. For a resistor, it's just dissipated, dissipated to heat. For a light bulb, it's dissipated to heat and light, right? Um, so for a resistor, um, P is just I delta V, and you could use Ohm's law. So replace I with V over R, and you get P is V squared over R. Or replace V with IR, you get P equals I squared R. Um, if you know just the current or the voltage and the resistance, you can figure out the power being dissipated in a resistor. And that was a homework problem. Now, everything we've talked to up to now about circuits was effectively a DC or direct current circuit. What that really means is the current always goes in the same direction, and it's constant. If you have a bunch of resistors hooked up to a battery, the current will be constant because the potential difference of the battery stays the same. The resistance of all the resistors stays the same. You'll just have a constant current running through everything. Things get more interesting when you mix resistors and capacitors. So we've talked about capacitors, capacitors and circuits. The first thing, remember a capacitor, we have this Q equals CV. So that's the charge stored on one plate of the capacitor. Remember you have plus Q on one side, minus Q on the other side. So there's no net charge but it's separated in the capacitor. So Q is how much charge is separated, plus on one plate, minus on the other plate. C is the capacitance of the capacitor. And I gave you expressions for that way back before the first test. And V is the potential difference across the capacitor. So that's how much charge is on the capacitor. Well, um, in this case, uh, what'll happen, so here's, here's how you think about these circuits, is that along one of these wires here, there's zero potential difference. So the potential difference between the top and bottom plate of the capacitor is exactly the same as the potential difference between uh, the top and bottom side of the battery. So the potential, if you do a loop thing, you've got plus V0 here, and then the same potential difference, minus V0 across there, VC has to equal V0. And um, so there's not going to be any current flowing because there's no potential difference anywhere along. Um, I mean, the, yeah, there's no current flowing in this case because there's no there's nothing left over to drive it so current is zero the charge on the capacitor just stays what it is right so if there was current flowing that means the charge on the capacitor would be changing and then after a while the potential difference across the capacitor would not be the same as v0 but that can't be because these wires mean that potential difference is just going to be exactly the same so we're just going to have right so current can't be flowing just sort of that's sort of the logical conclusion of so th that's a very simple case. Just you charge it. That's how you charge up a capacitor. You just put a battery across it. Boom. Now the capacitor very quickly, the capacitor has charge V zero across, sorry, potential difference V zero across it. You can figure out the charge. Well, if instead I start with an uncharged capacitor. So imagine there's a switch in this circuit. So I have an open circuit and at time T equals zero, I close the switch. Current can start flowing. Initially, if the capacitor is uncharged, there is no potential difference across it. So initially, the current's just going to be um, V0 divided by R, right? Because all there's a resistor, no potential difference across the capacitor, so that's not going to slow down the current. But as current flows, positive charge will build up on the top plate, negative charge on the bottom plate of the capacitor. There will be a potential difference across the capacitor. So the leftover potential difference across the resistor will go down as the potential difference across the capacitor goes up. And the result is you'll get a, um, 
uh, voltage across the capacitor as a function of time that looks like this. And then we define this thing called the time constant. That's tau here. Um, in a simple circuit like this, the time constant is just RC, the resistance times the capacitance. RC, the time constant, is how long it takes for the potential difference across the capacitor to get to 0.63 of the potential difference across the battery. The equation is over here on the right. You see there's an exponential. And if you know e to the minus t over rc, what that means is it takes infinite time for e to the minus t over rc to get to 0. right? So e to the minus t um, at e to the 0 is 1. So at time t equals 0, vc is equal to v0 times 1 minus 1, or vc equals 0. As time goes up, e to the minus t, t over rc gets smaller and smaller and smaller, but it never actually gets all the way to 0. It just approaches 0. So we have 1 minus um, something approaching 0, which means vc is going to approach 1. It's going to start at 0, and it's going to approach 1. It never gets all the way, or it's going to approach 1 times v0, I should say. So vc never gets all the way to v0. But after something like five time constants, it's less than 1% away. So if you wait five time constants, it's usually close enough that you can treat it as being charged all the way up. Um, so t, the time constant is not how long it takes the charge capacitor, the capacitor to charge up, because that's forever. But it does tell you how long does it take to get to 63% charge. And why 0.63? Well, because that's just um, e to the negative 1, right? So, or rather, it's 1 minus e to the negative 1. And, and since e is the natural exponential number, we just base things on that. That's where that 0.63 came from. All right, so that's what happens if you put a resistor and a capacitor together. If you start with a charged capacitor, so again, I could have a battery on the left that I didn't draw here across the capacitor, keeps the capacitor charged up. When I open the switch to the battery, now all that we're left with is the circuit I've drawn. The capacitor starts charge as current flows. That means positive charge is leaving the top plate, negative charge is coming on to the bottom plate. So the as current flows, the charge on the plates of the capacitor goes down. So the voltage across the capacitor goes down. Um, and as the voltage on the capacitor goes down, the rate at which current flows the resistor goes down. And so you get this curve here. And that's just an exponential decay. It works out when you have the rate um, going the way it does here. And again, the time constant, the resistance times the capacitor, is how long it takes to get to 37% of where it started. Right? So time equals RC. So you can, you know, you can figure out times using that. All right. Well, so what we those last two things that were simple examples of AC circuits. Um, but really, when you say AC, so that's just sort of non-constant circuits is what they are. When you say AC current, alternating current, you're often talking about like the current we get from our wall, the wall current. And in that case, the the uh, current, or really just the voltage, so stick a, uh, an oscilloscope across, don't do this for real, but were you to stick, take an oscilloscope, which is just something that looks at voltage as a function of time, and take the two probes and plug it into the two sides of your wall socket, you would see it's a sine wave, that the voltage um, oscillates up and down. For your wall socket, it oscillates at 60 hertz, which means 60 cycles per second. So in one second, it would go through 60 complete sine waves. So the period is 1 60th of a second. So that's what this F here is the frequency. Um, and then we define this thing angular frequency, 2 pi over omega. Why? Because that's just the thing that goes in the sine wave. Um, but so the frequency hertz would be 60 cycles per second. So T is the number of seconds per cycle is 1 over F, 1 60th of a second is what it would be in that case. And so the voltage um, oscillates between positive and negative, and that's what alternating current really looks like. Well, when you quote, and so your wall current is 120 volts, that does not mean that the amplitude is 120 volts. The average is zero, of course, right? Because it's positive as long as it's ne negative. What that 120 volts really is, is the RMS, root mean square voltage. What does that mean? It means measure the, the voltage at a whole bunch of individual points in time, a lot of them, um, square them all, add them up, divide by the number of points. So that is the mean of the squares. Now take a square root. That's the root of the mean of the squares. So, and it turns out for a sine wave that the average of V squared um, is the same as, 
VAC squared. Well, why? Because it's just the root mean squared. Um, and why do we do that? Why do we care about this? Well, because over long times, the power dissipated in the circuit is just this VAC squared over R. Um, so that's, that's why this RMS thing is a useful thing, because it allows us to figure out power. Instantaneously, the power is always changing, because sometimes the voltage is higher, sometimes the voltage is lower, the resistance is constant. But over time, that's the rate at which power is going to be used up, right? So, you know, at any given moment, Ohm's law still works. So at any given instance, the current running through the resistor, it's going to slosh back and forth. Um, but then over time, the RMS current is what determines the power. All right, so that's, so an AC circuit, and then this circuit element on the left, where I have this little sine wave in a circle that just indicates it's an AC voltage source with a voltage across the thing, go back to the previous slide, where the voltage across the thing follows a sine wave like this, and then what it's, the power supply is labeled as is not the amplitude, but actually the RMS. Well, you can do interesting things by putting a resistor and a capacitor together and then measuring different parts of the circuit. If I have a voltage, AC voltage source, and then I hook up a resistor and a capacitor like this, and I measure the voltage as a function of time between uh, the two points there, which is just meaning the measure across the capacitor. Well, if you think about what happens, it takes time for the capacitor to charge up. Um, so if the voltage has a really, really low frequency, and it it's changes slowly, so the rate, if you if you take like the period, is a whole lot longer than the time constant RC, then the time it takes the capacitor to charge up is small compared to how long it takes the, the voltage to change. The capacitor's voltage will be able to track the power supply's voltage very closely. So that means the voltage across the capacitor should have about the same amplitude as the voltage across the power supply. On the other hand, for very fast changes, if the voltage is oscillating up and down very quickly, well, it takes time of order RC for the capacitor's voltage to change appreciably. And if the uh, voltage on the left is going up and down faster than then that happens, the capacitor can sort of never catch up. And so the voltage across the capacitor will always just always be lagging. It's sort of like if you're a parent and you're trying to chase around your kid and your kid is really fast running left and right and the kid passes you to the left and you turn and you try to run to the left. But by the time you've made a step, the kid's reached the end of his motion, turned around and run back and passes you going to the right. So you stop, you turn around and you take a step to the right, but then the kid is turned around to get right. So you're slowly, you can't keep up. That's what the capacitor's voltage does here. So it just oscillates just a tiny little bit. Um, and if it goes fast enough, it can't oscillate at all. Um, whereas if the kid was just sort of, instead of a kid, it's a snail moving left and right, you can easily keep up with it. So this is called a low pass filter because low frequencies get passed. So for low frequencies, uh, meaning long periods, the voltage across the right side will be the same as the voltage on the AC. So you think of the, the AC as the input here. For high frequencies, they get filtered out. That's what makes it a low pass filter. High pass filter is the other way around, and this is just... If the voltage across the capacitor can't keep up, then the voltage across the resistor has to make up the difference. So this is just going to work in the opposite way of the last thing. Right, so that's circuits. Now, we go on to magnetic fields. Why? Because current is what interacts with magnetic fields. So we got current, and now we can talk about magnetic fields. Magnetic fields, like electric fields, it's a vector field. What that means is that every point in space, the magnetic field has a value. It points in a direction, and it has a magnitude, and it can be different at different points in space. Um, and the direction of the magnetic field does not have to line up with the um, direction of the displacement from the origin. It could be in any old direction. Um, Teslas are the unit of magnetic fields. That's how it connects it. And really, what do we do with magnetic fields? We move charges around. So this force equation here, F is equals QV cross B. If you have a charge Q moving at velocity V, and there's a magnetic field B there, the force will be um, that cross product. And so you'll have to remember how to do cross products to do this. Well, you can use the right hand rule. And if you do that here, you'll discover that's the direction of the force. Remember, if you cross two vectors, the result is perpendicular to both of those vectors. So the force is always perpendicular to both the velocity and the magnetic field. And because the force is perpendicular to the velocity, it can't change the speed. All it can do is change the direction of the velocity. Um, this also means if the velocity is along the magnetic field, there's no force because the cross product of two parallel vectors or anti-parallel vectors is zero. Uh, 
Well, since it can't change the speed, but it can change the direction, that's exactly what you need to move around in circles. Right, so if you have, let's start on the right, you have this positive charge. Um, if it's moving where I've drawn it um, up on the page and you have a magnetic field that's out of the page, uh, you can do your right hand rule, right? Here's the uh, direction of velocity QV cross B. You get a force to the right like that. And so that'll curve the particle to the right. Well, if you do that at any point along this, you'll see that it's going around in a circle, assuming a constant magnetic field. So the mag magnitude of the force is constant. So magnetic fields will tend to move things around in circles. The speed stays the same. The direction keeps changing. Uh, a negative particle will go in the opposite direction because, of course, when you do QV, well, V is up. But if I multiply that by a Q that's negative, it flips the direction of the vector. So QV is down. So I did the thing again. I did QV cross B, which is out. That's going to point off to the left here now. And uh, remembering circular motion. Um, F equals mv squared over r. That's how much force you need to keep a particle of mass m moving at speed v in a circle of radius r. Well, if it's the magnetic field supplying that, then the magnetic force, um, and if v is perpendicular to b, then v cross b, its magnitude is v times b. We get qvb has to equal mv squared over r, although really I should have said the absolute value of q here because um, r is not going to be negative. It's the radius of a circle, and the magnitude of the force is always positive. So really, that's Q, the magnitude of V times the magnitude of B times the absolute value of Q is the magnetic force. And you can figure out what's the radius it's going to move around in. Um, so you can put together electric and magnetic fields into a single force law. We had F equals QE for electric fields, F equals QV cross B for magnetic fields. Well, really, you can just treat that as one force. It's called the Lorentz force. If the magnetic field is zero, then it's the old F equals QE. If the electric field is zero, it's F equals QV cross B. So this is the only equation you need. It's just if there's no magnetic field, then it's simpler. If there's no electric field, well, <laughs> there's a cross product. So it's not that simple, but it's still simpler. Uh, OK, so back. Remember, current is a whole bunch of moving charges. Um, if there is a force on a moving charge, then there will also be a force on a current. Right, so if you look here, IL hat, this is from earlier, is NQ VD A hat. That's like a charge Q moving with velocity VD. That's exactly what you need to get a magnetic force. And so it works out if you put all these things together, this green thing on the bottom, FB is IL cross B. I is the magnitude of the current. L is the length of the wire you're trying to find the force on. And... L vector points in the direction of the current along the wire. Um, and then B is the magnetic field. So if the magnetic field's along the current, you won't have any force. But if the magnetic field's perpendicular, or even at some other angle, you will have a force on this current. And so magnetic fields can move around little wires. And after this exam, well, eventually we'll talk about um, motors. And how does a motor work? It has a magnetic field, it runs a current, and the force on that current um, gets the thing moving and that's that's how an electric motor works but we'll come back to that so you have forces on currents and we've dealt with that as well well it turns out current just like with electric field um, electric charges electric field exerts a force on an electric charge where do you get electric fields from electric charges well same thing current is the source of magnetic field um, and I gave you a couple of uh, examples. One is you have a really long wire and again really long means the distance to where the wire bends is much larger than the distance you're looking at away from the wire. The magnetic field curls around the wire in circles like this, and its magnitude is mu naught i over 2 pi r. Mu naught's just a constant. i is the current flowing through the wire. r is the distance away from the wire. Um, and then you use your right hand rule, right? So it's coming, um, which direction is this going? It's going like that, right? The, the current. This is the curly right-hand rule, I call it sometimes. The current's going in that direction, so the magnetic field's going to curl around like that, which is what I've drawn. That's the direction of it, so it curls around like that. Or if you look at this, you can look at it edge on, um, on the top here, current coming out of the page, the direction of the magnetic field, and then the magnitude goes down as 1 over R. On the left, visualizing the same thing, only the current's going up, and now I'm using the little dot vectors for coming out of the page and x vectors for going into the page. Another magnetic field that we know about is if you have a solenoid, that's just a bunch of a stack of loops of current. Um, so these are little circular currents all stacked up. Uh, I did a little animation to see what a solenoid looks like a couple of lectures back. You can go look at that again. Um, 
it turns out outside of very long solenoid, the magnetic field is zero, really for an infinite solenoid. So it's just really small for just a long solenoid. Inside, the magnetic field is constant. It's along the axis of the solenoid. Again, you can use the curly right hand rule here. So it's curling around like this. That's the direction of the current in these loops. So the magnetic field is that way um, up on the page here. Um, and then N over L is the number of loops per length of solenoid. So how long, if the solenoid's one meter long and there's a thousand um, loops stacked up, N over L would be 1,000 meters to the minus one, 1,000 loops per meter, right? And so that's, that's how you can figure out the magnetic field inside a solenoid. Well, all right. We talked about electric dipoles. We talked about magnetic dipoles. You make an electric dipole with just two. In fact, let's go to the next slide. You make an electric dipole with just a positive and negative charge. There's two poles. But there's no such thing as a magnetic monopole. So how do you make a magnetic dipole with a little loop of current? And then there's this thing called the dipole moment. It's just a new vector. The dipole moment, is uh, its magnitude is the current that's flowing times the cross-sectional area of the loop enclosed by the current. So in this case, it's a little circle of current of radius r. The cross-sectional area would be pi r squared. If it was a square of side a by a, then the area would just be a squared. And then n hat is just a unit vector perpendicular to the area. You use the right-hand rule again, right? So if I curl my fingers around in the direction of the current, that's the direction of the magnetic moment. And so that, that's the magnetic dipole moment. Um, and then you can use that in various equations. But sometimes, how do you deal with it? If it's a magnetic dipole moment, you go back and you think about a loop of current. And I'll do an example at the end here. Um, so I said there's no magnetic monopoles. If you break a bar magnet apart, which is like a dipole, you just get two smaller bar magnets. Whereas you can separate an electric dipole into individual charges. Well, so how do you use these um, magnetic dipoles? Well, it's actually kind of a long expression. I think I told you it's not that bad. You can look it up on Wikipedia. But here's two simple examples. If you are along the axis, that means in a direction that is along the same direction as the direction of the dipole. So on the top, I have an electric dipole and the dipole moment p vector is pointing to the right, which I've just chosen that to be the direction of the z axis, then the electric field along the plus z axis is going to be 2k times the um, dipole moment divided by z cubed. So if you know the dipole moment, you can find the electric field. On the bottom, magnetic field, same thing. Um, the constant's different. Instead of 2k, we have mu naught over 2 pi, but then it's the magnetic dipole moment divided by z cubed, and that'll tell you what is the strength of the magnetic field from this dipole a distance z away um, in the plus z direction away from the dipole, assuming the dipole is oriented along the z direction. And the other one I gave you is perpendicular to, to the axis. So if the dipole is along the z direction, this might be the x-axis, or it could be the y-axis. It could be anywhere in the xy plane. So you notice this r, the displacement from the dipole to the point where I'm measuring the field, is perpendicular to the direction of the dipole moment. In this case, we have it still goes as 1 over r cubed one over the distance cubed, um, but notice that the electric field points in the opposite direction from the electric dipole. And likewise, the magnetic field points in the opposite direction from the magnetic, di magnetic dipole. And you can go back a few lectures where I showed you the whole field of a dipole. Well, all right, and so I want to stop by just going through one of the problems on the homework. What I said on the homework is you have a current running in the plus x direction, offset from the current in the y direction, there is a magnetic dipole pointing in the z direction. That's what this picture is supposed to show here. I've got my axes up into the left. There's a long wire. So the current's flowing in the plus x direction. So that's the direction of it. The position of the magnetic dipole is offset in the y direction. So I move up off of the current in the plus y direction. And then the magnetic dipole itself is oriented in the z direction. So that little vector coming out of the page, that is the magnetic dipole. And the question is, what is the direction of the force on the magnetic dipole? And how do you even figure that out? Um, you don't start with the magnetic field or the magnetic dipole. That would be if I wanted to know what is the direction of the force on the current. And you could do that. Um, if you go to the video, I think it was video number 32, whatever the last homework video I posted was, I figure out the direction of the force of one magnetic dipole on another. So this is a simpler example than that. Well, so how do you do this? Well, all right. How you often work these out is you think about dipoles as little loops. 
So I've replaced my dipole with a little square loop of current. It's A by A on a side. So the magnetic moment is just I A squared. I use the right hand rule here. The direction of the current is like that. So sure enough, the magnetic moment points out of the page. Um, and then and then A has to be much smaller than D, the distance away from the wire, for this to really act like a true dipole. I've exaggerated it for drawing purposes here. So the magnetic moment will just be I A squared Z. So whatever the force is on this little loop of current is the same as the force on a magnetic, di magnetic dipole M, as long as I make A small. So what I can do now is work out what are these forces. Well, first, I have to get the magnetic field from the current. And how do I do that? Well, um, I can use the right-hand rule again. So the current is um, pointing off to the right like that. That's the direction of the current. So the magnetic field is going to curl around. And you notice above the current here, it's out of the page. So that's what these little blue uh, circle dots are, the magnetic fields coming out of the page. Remember, the magnetic field gets weaker as you get farther away from the current. So that's why I've drawn the magnetic field on the bottom here bigger than the magnetic field on the top. And then it's sort of in between for the magnetic field on the side legs. All right. And <clears throat> so then how do I work out the net force on this loop? Well, I figure out the force on each of the four legs and I add them all up. Let's start with the right and left legs. Um, so on the right side here, I have current going in that direction. And I have a magnetic field that's out of the page. So the force is going to be to the right. On the left side, I have current that's going down in the little loop. And then the magnetic field it's interacting with is out of the page. So that tells me that the current, uh, that the force is off to the left, right? So on the right side, you had current off to the right. On the left side, you had current off to the left. Because these two legs are the same distance away from the wire, the magnitudes will be the same. The magnitude of the current's the same throughout the loop. The magnitudes of the magnetic field will be the same. So those two are just going to cancel each other out. So there'll be no net force as a result of those two legs. So we need to think about the top and the bottom leg. So let's start with the top leg. Um, with the top leg, you have a, a current that's off to the left, right? It's off to the left. And the magnetic field is out of the page. And so the force is that way. And then so the force is going to be up on the top leg. And then on the bottom leg, you have a current that's off um, to the right. Magnetic field out of the page. So I L cross B, the force is down. So again, those would tend to cancel up on the top, down on the bottom. But here, the fact that the magnetic field is stronger on the side that's closer to the wire matters. Since that magnetic field is stronger there and the current's perpendicular to the magnetic field in both cases, the force on the bottom leg, what I call F2 here, is stronger than the force on the top leg. So there will be a net force towards the wire, a net force in the minus Y direction, just by adding all of those up. So that was just an example from the homework. All right, so whirlwind tour of all the things that we've done. Not even all the things we've done. There's things like the whole, what does the whole magnetic dipole field look like, which I didn't go through here, but I did do earlier. And so the test will be on the stuff that we have covered that I talked about today. Not just the slides from today, of course, all of the slides, but the test will be on um, current circuits and magnetic fields, including magnetic dipoles. Um, all right. On Friday, I'm going to have a lecture about magnetic induction. That will not be on the test next week. Um, so that's the beginning of the next set of lectures. So um, if you want, you can kind of delay and do things out of order and take the test first. I'll probably post the test over the weekend. All right, that's all.